Jonathan Brown. Brother Jonathan, uh, he and his family, of course, they sang yesterday. Uh, he, he is with our Ron Middleton's uh, Missions Outreach. And they're, uh, of course, we're starting churches and trying to reach people with the gospel. And uh, Brother Jonathan is part of that. I know that he, they were just with Twin Rivers not too long ago, and uh, we're, we're thankful for them. He's a blessing. He's a friend to me, and I love him and his family. Brother Jonathan, you come preach for us. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Uh, I promise I do not deserve it. Anything, standing ovation, nothing, a clap. I, I, honestly, I just, I feel like the least of anybody to be up here. I thank you for the opportunity. And uh, if you get your Bibles, turn into Luke chapter 10. So we're going to be at this morning. And uh, you may wonder why I have a, a coat with me, preacher does. And uh, this is going to be an illustration, and, and I want you to envision this as a, a man left for dead. There he is. He's lifeless. He's cold. He can't do nothing for himself. You can envision a bear beaten up, battered man. If you can envision a man, a person that's been chewed up by the world and spit out for no good. Leading up to the text where we're at, Jesus has been traveling. He is well into his ministry here on earth. He's done many things. He's done many miracles. He has done, uh, he, he's raised the dead. He's called spirits out of people. He's healed the blind. He's healed the sick. He has done many wonderful things, and he has caught the attention. <clears throat> he has caught the attention of the Pharisees, and so one of the Pharisees, being a lawyer, has stood up to challenge Christ. And Christ was no novice in dealing with people. He created them. Hello. Amen. You think you're ever going to back Christ into a corner? Let me tell you, give up before you start. He laid, he laid the foundations of the world before he, you even knew anything. Before you were conceived in your mother's womb, he had a plan for your life. Yes, sir. Before the fall of man, he had a plan to redeem you. That's right. That's right. The man, the God that created you, created the same very tree that he would die on. You thought about that. In this passage, everybody knows it is the Good Samaritan. Most people are familiar with this. I mean, just about anybody, everybody, the Samaritan, people, it was Good Samaritan, good guys. I mean, even in Hollywood, it's referred to as a, a Good Samaritan. People ain't got a clue what they're talking about. But they'll yeah. say it anyways. Yeah. Sounds good. If you'll stand, we'll start our reading in verse 25. And I want you to pay close attention to the verbiage of this passage. I believe every word of God that is written in the Bible is there for a reason. If you pay attention closely to the language that is used in your King James Bible, you can see patterns. You can see reasons. Yes, you can gain an understanding of what the Lord is truly trying to tell us. Yes. And I believe this morning that we have something to get out of this text. Right. There was another message that I was preparing. I was getting together. It was called, Lose the Load, Camel. <laughs> and the Lord said, no, I, just, I don't want you to push that to the side. It's been heavy on my heart. I've been burdened over this. Amen. And here's one of these words, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, uh, What is written in the law? How readest thou? 
I love how Jesus likes to answer a question with getting people to back themselves into their own corners. Amen? Amen. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. Do this, and thou shalt live. But in the very next verse, he said, But he, the certain lawyer, willing to justify himself. You can't do that, by the way. He is talking to the justification. He is talking to the propitiation for his sins. And he is refusing to see that the exact commandment that he has said himself, he is not even following. And why is he not following this? Because he does not believe Jesus to be God. You can't love God unless you believe in God. Can I say that he skipped right over the thing that was the answer to his question, and then he asked the wrong question. And he said, Unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? He's looking for another work to do. He's looking for somebody else to invest in as a work, as a notch in his belt to justify himself. Can I say the correct question was, how do I love God? That's the very question that he skipped over that should have been asked to begin with. You want to know how to go to heaven? Ask how to love God. The commandment is, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. Now there's the answer to the question. Jesus, no, he is talking to a lawyer of the law. Now the lawyers back in that time is not what we believe to, we see today of law and order and all these things and, and the written secular law. The lawyers knew the Old Testament. That was law. They were very efficient in... The Old Testament Word of God. So he knows he's talking to a man that believes in a work-based salvation, if you will. A work-based redemption. And Jesus answering and said, Jesus knows he's not getting this. This is not even here for the lawyer's benefit, can I say? That's right. That's right. It's for everybody else who's listening. It's, yes, it's for our benefit today. Amen. And Jesus answering said, a certain man. Hey, look, there's that word again. Yeah. A certain man. Yeah. Went where? Down. Yeah. From Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wound him and departed, leaving him half dead. There he is. Yeah. And look at this. And by chance there came down what? A certain priest. Which direction was he going? Down. He was headed down. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a priest, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan... A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was and he saw him, had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more. When I come again, I will repay thee. Now which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go. Go and do thou 
likewise. With the Lord's help this morning, I want to bring a thought to you on the road to Jericho. On the road to Jericho. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. God, I need you in a bad way. God, I can't stand up here and do anything unless you help me. God, I've got a burden for these people. I've got a burden for these young people. God, we need you this morning, Lord, if you would just see fit to overshadow us just a little bit. Open our hearts, open our minds. God, let us captivate the attention of these people for just a short space of time. Lord, may you understand what this means. Lord, how I understand how I've perceived this text. God, I love you for everything that you do. We'll give you honor and the praise and glory, God. It's only you. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we said in this parable, there's a lawyer that is questioning. It says he tempted Jesus, which basically means he is trying to put Jesus on trial to prove who he is. And as Jesus is being tried, he tries the man. How about that? Well, you've asked me this question. Let me see what you know. What do you say? What is your take on this? And as we're reading this text, there's a very specific people. There's a very specific location. There are two locations given for a very specific purpose that I believe. And I would like to show you that this morning. Jesus could have said that this man was going from anywhere to anywhere. He could have said that it was any kind of road in the, anywhere. So why did he say that this man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho? What is this correlation? What does this mean? Jerusalem is a house of worship. It's the place of worship. Hey, listen to me this morning. My notes are not hard. I've got four, four or five points and it's every character in here. So please just pay attention a little bit this morning if you would. Jerusalem is the place where God wants you. It's where you're in the perfect will of God. It's where you've given it all to Jesus and you're running the race till you get to the finish line and you're all in, you're all given, you're all there. And everything that you have, you've laid at the Master's feet for His purpose and for His use and His use alone. Jerusalem is a place of safety. It's a place of where God wants you to be. It's not where you want to be. It's not where you think is good. It's not what you think is right. It's not where you think that you're going to have a more successful life. It's not where you think is right in your own eyes. There's a man. There's a way that seemeth right to a man. But the end there is destruction. There's no doubt that this certain man thought he was a good man. It says he was in Jerusalem, the house of worship, right? He came from he came from where God wanted him to be. Now there's some people that say, well, maybe he lived in Jericho. I don't think that's the correlation God's trying to get across here. This is a parable, which means every word in this is for a reason. There's a purpose from where he was to where he's going. Now, if you'll read your Bible and you'll study it, every time there's two words that means that you're either where you should not be or you're headed the wrong direction. And those two words, one is down. Now, we've heard that. Another one is sojourn. Now, sojourn does not necessarily mean that you're in the wrong place. It's just you're in a place you don't belong. You can sojourn in a place and it not be sin. You can't. It's when you stay. It's when your journey sets up roots. Okay? Abram, he went down and journeyed to Egypt in a time of famine. And what happened there? He deceived the king. He deceived Pharaoh saying, well, this, this is my sister. Not this is my wife. I'm in fear of my life. I'm in fear of her life. We're in a bad way. I'm not going to trust God right now. And I'm going to say that this is my sister to see what happens. 
Well, he didn't learn the first time. He sojourned to Gerar. What happened there? He did the same thing. And what did his son do? He went to Gerar, the same place, and called his wife his sister. Mom and dad, if you want your kids to do right, can I suggest you do it? They will do what they see, and they will do what they learn from you. Now, another one we have is Elimelech took his family to Moab. And uh, all of these were tough situations where people were in a pinch. And they went down. If you read and you study and you look, the locations to where these men were to where they went was down. But Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, if you look on the map, Jericho is north east of Jerusalem. So if you weren't really paying attention and you didn't really know what's going on, if you look at a map, you say, well, he wasn't going down at all. He was going directionally up. There's a way that seemeth right to a man. Directionally towards the compass, he's going northeast. But positionally, positionally, he was headed down. Did you know that Jerusalem sits some 2,600 feet above sea level, while Jericho sits 800 feet below sea level? They're 3,400 feet in span difference. He had to go down a whole long way. Jericho, can I put it to you like this? Jericho is the lowest inhabited place on earth. You can't go any lower. Jericho is the lowest place you can go. Jericho, back before Joshua, with the help of the Lord, took the walls down. You know the story. Six days. On the seventh day, seven times around, seven priests, seven trumpets. With a loud shout, the blow of the trumpets, the walls come down. And and Joshua and the children of Israel go in and take that place. Now, why did God want that to happen? It was a wicked, evil place. It was founded by Ham, the cursed son of Noah. Jericho was known for their idol worship to the moon god. Did you know that? Where else do we see a moon god worship? Jezebel. Astra. And if you follow and look at the worship there, I'm not going to get into. It's a sensual worship. Jericho believed in that. They believed in reincarnation. They believed in worshiping their ancestors. They believed in all of these false idols. Not God. When that city was destroyed, it was meant to stay gone. There was a curse put on that place. It was said that the man that would start building that place, at the beginning of the construction, his firstborn would die. And at the hanging of the gate, or the completion, that his youngest would die. That man's name was Hiel. It is the only time this man is mentioned in the Bible. And guess whose reign Jericho was built back up under? Ahab and Jezebel. I want to say something really quick to you kids. Your parents. Your parents have fought some battles. They have laid waste to some strongholds in their lives. They have cast out sins from their homes, not just for you to pick them up and run with them when you get out. Don't rebuild the strongholds of Jericho that your parents built that they broke down and they yes. built up walls around it just so they can keep you safe. Yes, sir. The dangers that lie outside of those walls. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. I have tried so hard to build things up good. in my life as a parent, as a safeguard for my children. Right. Yes. Amen. 
God to watch them just break them down and go rebuild the same strongholds that God helped me take down in my life. I stand up here as a man one time on the road to Jericho. I walked out of the house of God. I walked out of the house of worship and I traveled down that road to Jericho and before I even got to my destination, the devil laid waste of my life. Hey, I'm not preaching this as something that just come from the Bible. I'm preaching this as something that's come from my life. The road to Jericho is a wicked road. The first man we see on this road is a certain man that decided to leave the house of worship and travel down this road. He was drawn away from the lust of his eyes. He was drawn away to the way that Jericho may have looked fun. He may have heard about the riotous living. Does that sound familiar? The prodigal got caught staring at a far distant place. Then he decides to say, you give me what's mine and I'm gone. And next time you see him, he's in a hog pen slopping up with the animals the leftovers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Empty, barren, yeah. desolate. Right. The Bible says that this man was stripped from his raiment. Do you understand that in the Bible, one of the biggest forms of shame was to be exposed? Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now people do it for fun. Come on. Come on. Come on God help us. Yes. Hey, cover yourself up. Yeah. I don't want to see it. I've got a heart to, to, to protect. I've got a mind to protect. I don't want to see it. And if you are a Christian at all, you have no business exposing any of yourself. Cover it up. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. Hey, men ought to be covered up too. Hello? We want running around outside with your shirt off thinking you look all hot. Man alive, it makes me want to puke every time I see something like that. There's a certain man on this road to Jericho. You realize before he even got to his destination, he was overtaken? Listen now. said they fell on him. He was taken by surprise. He was not expecting it. Yes, sir. He had an aim in mind. He had a goal in mind. He was ready to leave the house of worship to go to a wicked place. And he was taken by surprise. The next thing we see is the thieves. The thieves. There's only one person in the Bible that is described as the thief. The Bible says in John 10, 10, I had to look up the reference, sorry. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. The Bible says in James 1, 15, but when lust, lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. The second characters we see on the road to Jericho are a heartless, don't care, don't, don't, don't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your reputation. It doesn't matter how much life you've got going for you. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how poor you are. It is a thief that wants nothing but to kill you. To destroy you. And can I say he made a public example. Yes, sir. He left him on the side of the road. He wasn't covered up. Right. There wasn't a bush on top of him. Right. There wasn't something to protect him from people seeing him. Yes. He was laid out for all to see. Yes. Yes. Right. And when the people walked by, they said, there's another victim. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Come on. That's right. There's another victim. The thieves got him. 
The next character I want to look at is the certain priest. Certain priest. Okay. He was talking to a certain lawyer. You see that? This certain lawyer probably held a position within the religious council. Okay? But if you look at your text, it said he was headed down. You know what that tells me? He was on the same road as this certain man. So this is the certain priest headed for destruction. And what happens when this priest sees him? He's walking from afar off, I believe. It says that by chance. Can I say I don't believe that by chance meant that he just happened to be there? I believe that by chance was it happened to be at the same time. Okay? Not that it wasn't the purpose of the priest to be headed that direction. This man just got there before he did. And Brother Luke, it says that when he looked, he saw... Bless that guy's heart. Mm. I couldn't help him if I wanted to because I'm in the same direction. Boy, that's good. Boy, that's good. Amen. How many men are sitting in here? And I don't know your heart. God knows your heart. But I know I've been in this position. And I've seen Christians. I've seen people beaten up. They're battered. They're bruised. Preachers, they need help. But there's no way I can help them. Because I'm headed the same direction. I've got the same sin and wickedness in my heart. Jesus went to these men. He said, you're a bunch of stinking vipers. You're whitey sepulchers. You're wicked as the devil. Hey, you look good on the outside, but what's inside of you is nothing but death. It's rotten. It's sinful. You may be fooling everybody else, and you may look good. That's right. That's right, But you're that man on the inside. Come on. And it's just a matter of time, honey, until you are there. Can I say to shame? Yes, sir. I have personally known more men of God that have fell and made it. Brother Luke, in my youth group, when I grew up in church, I think there may be one of us that didn't fall before they came back. And maybe three or four of us came back at all. Forty? Are you listening to me? Maybe 10% are even care about what God thinks. Young preacher boys, let me tell you something. You, you have confessed your call to preach. If you are a young preacher boy, stand up. Amen. You've got a target on your back. I confessed the call to preach when I was 12 years old. By the time I was 14, 15, I wrecked it. That's right. I was drawn out yep. by what I saw. Yep. Yep. Hey, right. can I say I was turned away from church because of what I heard inside? Yep. I'm going to hit on that in just a second. Yep. Come on, Mom. You have a responsibility. Yep. If you're a man of God, period, yep. stand up. Right. If you're a God-called preacher, stand up. Yes. Now, I'm nobody to tell anybody what to do. Please, this is, uh, please. What you do in private matters. Because when I was your age, I saw these older men walk out on their wives. Pastors. By the time I was 15, I watched four. You want to know why our churches are dying? 
That's right. It's because men that call themselves men of God will yes. not keep their hearts clean. Yes. They won't keep their minds pure before God. Yes. They won't stay at an altar. They won't stay yes. praying. Right. They won't do what's necessary to That's keep right. themselves from the devil. That's and right. they come in. The devil throws them down on the ground. Yes. And he stops a mud hole in them. And he leaves them exposed for all to see. Yes. Yes. And then he's done. Yes. Yes. He's done. Yes. He's done. Yes. These young men that have watched you older men, they're done. Y'all can have a seat. Thank you. Done. And young men, young preacher boys, nobody cares what you've done in 10 minutes. You want me to have respect for somebody that upholds the truth of the Word of God? You show me what they've done in 30 years. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. And God help me. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I'm wet behind the ears. But I've watched it. Yes, sir. My whole life. There's a certain man. On the road to Jericho, there are thieves. There's a certain priest on the road to Jericho. On the road to Jericho, I see that there is a Levite. Generalized. He's not a certain Levite. It doesn't even say he's going down. Doesn't give a direction of travel at all. I'm going to call this the wandering Levite. And it's a generalization. A Levite, if you know Levite, they were, they were chosen to be able to take care of the house of God, the priests, the, the workers of the house. They, they took care of all of that stuff. So if I could generalize a Levite as a reputation, not by position like the priest. And can I say really quickly that that, that priest, that reputation by by who they are, the position. The Sunday school teachers, deacons, preachers' wives, you're in a position. You're in the public eye with a title. But this Levite is just a general Levite. It doesn't even say he's a priest. It doesn't say his duties. It doesn't say his job title. It says he's a Levite. So let's generalize this as a Christian. How about that? Amen. And that's a pretty broad term nowadays. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so broad you can't even put your finger on what it even means that's anymore. Right. That's right. That's right. But if you're a saved, born again, right. child of God, yeah. trying to live your life for Christ, yeah. Christian. Yeah. Let me put it that way. Have you made your mind up? If you want to be in Jerusalem or did you want to be in Jericho? Do you daily wander around trying to figure out what's going on? Try to figure out if you want to watch this show or not? Listen to this music or not? Hey, slow country music, it ain't that bad. They, they say Jesus maybe every now and then. Maybe they talk about the house of God where it changed their life, a bunch of foolish mess. You'll listen to that junk. They'll talk about sleeping around and drinking in one yeah. song. The next song, they're talking about going to church. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was that about music from a fool? Yeah. Hello? That's good. If that ain't a fool, I don't know what is. Yes, sir. Yeah. Maybe you listen to well, this is light rock. It's classic stuff. Well, it ain't that bad, really. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What about CCM? Come on now. I can't stand that mess. Yeah. Hey, maybe maybe this Levi is walking down the road. So let me tell you about my Jew. Oh well. <laughs> well. You know, the Bible says that he came and looked on him. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry for your troubles, buddy. But I can't get my hands dirty. That's good. To help oh. you. Come on. Oh, we're good for soul winning. Go ahead. We're good for bringing people to the house of God. Sure. But when the people come, 
And they mess up every now and then. Maybe they weren't raised like you were raised. Even children. Maybe they haven't had the upbringing like you do. But you don't, you don't have as much compassion. Good Samaritan. He has compassion. Don't give them a little bit of grace because you're too dumb and ignorant. To un- I said it. You're too dumb and ignorant to understand that they get in maybe an hour or two what you have your entire life. Amen. And you're so quick to write them off and send them out the door because they're a burden to you. God help your soul. I say you're going to answer to that. Oh, it's fun and games now. They aggravate me. I don't want them around me. They say mean things. They take too much. Hey, what happens when they're dropped off into hell and God looks at you and says, that was your responsibility. I put that person in your path. What's going to happen when you look down and say, ah, what is this? He's going to say, that's the blood required at your hand. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. The Levite did not have enough time, did not have the patience, did not have the compassion to do anything about it. They hadn't even made up their own mind. I'll go to church. I'll read my Bible and pray. Okay, who's at the center of your life? Is it you? Yeah. Is it your pride? Yeah, that's it right there. I go all over the place. We go all over the place, preacher. And it would stun you the things we see. It would amaze you the people that walk through those doors and they are looking for Christ. But because it may be a woman wearing pants. Maybe a tight dress. Maybe a, a short dress, skirt, and they're looked at like leprosy. And you know the bad thing about it is, in their mind, they've put something on decent. They've put on the best they've got. Who are you? Do you know their wardrobe? They wear a dress. Maybe I can put a dress on Go to church. Nobody ever told them that it needs to go go to their ankles. That's right. God help us. Our churches are filled with a bunch of Levite, whited sepulchers that would soon just look on somebody that needs help. Yeah, you're in a bad way. Hmm. Yeah, mom and daddy cusses and drinks. All they do is yell and scream at each other and Man, I know you've been in church maybe coming on Sunday morning, maybe, I don't know, maybe a year or two, maybe something like that. Well, you should know better by now. Really? Come on. Really? Yeah. It's taken me a lifetime to get where I'm at. Yeah, that's right. And I'm nowhere close. That's right. That's right. I got to move on. God help us to try to be holy. To have, to have compassion. As this Samaritan did. Why are we dying? Because we see people in need. We can't help them. Because we're in a mess ourselves. Or we just walk away. That looks bad. Hey. Somebody needs to help them. Maybe. Maybe brother so-and-so will. Maybe sister so-and-so will help them. Because I, I am too good. I am a Levite. I am a Christian. You're a devil is what you are. I got to go. Verse 33 said, but a certain... <laughs> a certain Samaritan. Amen. He didn't look at him and say, Oof, yeah. maybe you can get you some help. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let me know what happens. Mail that back to me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. A certain Samaritan looked on and said, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. Oh, man. You've been on this road too long. Yeah. You should have never left Jerusalem. Yeah. Oh, can I help you? Hey, let me pick you up. Uh, let, me, let me pick you up. And, and, and I'm going to put you on my own beast. And, and I'm going to make this journey. And I'm going to be the one walking. And you're going to be the one resting. And you're going to be the one getting healed. And you're going to be the one that gets the attention. Hey, I'm going to do the work for you. I, I'm not going to ask for anything in return. And I will pay the ultimate payment. Hey. I'll pay the ultimate price. That's what it takes. There was one day a Samaritan came my way. He says, he said, look, I know you left the house. Of, I know you left the house of worship. And I know this Jericho Road is seeing you up and spit you out. And you've got nothing left. When you're exposed and everybody knows what you are. Everybody knows where you've been. Everybody knows what you've been involved with. Now you've got a reputation. Everybody's seen it. And they've seen you. And they know. They know your sin. Yeah. You said, I died for you. I gave my life for you. I did the work on the cross of Calvary so you could have life. Life abundant. So you could go to heaven. So somebody could come and tell you about me. And I want to help you. I want to love you. I want to give you compassion. Brother Luke, I don't deserve I don't deserve to be here. I'm the last one preacher that deserves to stand in this place. And I don't know why God has just been so merciful to me. I don't know why He picked me up, Brother Yes. I don't know why He helped me. This dream I caused Him the reproach. I'm nothing. But as I laid on the road to Jericho, he came. He did the work. He healed my wounds. He picked me up. He dusted the dust off of my back. He cleaned me up. And he put me back in Jerusalem. That's why at the piano, please. Who are you? Which, which one of these characters are you? Hey, can I even ask you if you're one of the thieves? Oh, you don't think there are wolves in sheep's clothing? You've lost your mind. I'm not even going to say young person. I'm going to say person. Yes. Do you have a faraway look? You think Jericho has got better to offer you than Christ? Huh? What are you doing at 1 o'clock in the morning on your phone? What are you doing to satisfy your flesh? Paul said I die daily. He slays his flesh. What are you doing to satisfy yourself that God doesn't want you to? Hey, there are things that are weights. They're not wicked. They're not necessarily wrong. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are they overtaking you? Have they drawn you away from the house of worship? Can I say the house of the worship is safety and security in the arms of God? You'll have rough times. You'll have trials and tribulations. But there is a security and going to sleep every night knowing that God does not want you anywhere but where you are. Worker, are you effective? Can you be effective? Are you in the place where God can use you 
to help somebody? Christian, how's your attitude towards people? Would you help somebody even if they got on your nerves? Ouch. I'm going to tell you one thing, honey. You come to me and start running somebody down that don't understand. I won't stand there and listen to it. Why? One point in time. I was the man. And if you ever understand, honey, that you're that man too, there's one point in time that we were all without Christ. He said he was half dead. Yeah. That's right. And what happens when we get saved? Yes, sir. Uh. Yeah. That yeah. spirit inside of us is quickened and made alive. Yeah. And we become whole. Yeah. Yes. That means we're whole and full as a person in the sight of God. Yeah. Half dead. Yeah. Every one of us, if you've been saved, we're half dead. And if you're not saved, you're half dead today. And you need Christ. You know, I find it. It's my seventh landing. I believe that this picture of the Samaritan is a picture of Christ. Okay? But what is a Samaritan? They are half Jew, half Gentile. But wait a second. Jesus was born of the Jews. Right? Full-blooded Jewish descent. Ain't that right? Can I remind you of something? The bride of Christ is what? Gentile. And at the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we're one with Christ, it is a half Jew, half Gentile reunion. And when Christ is in you, that part of the Jew that is Christ inside of you should shine brighter than your Gentile nature. Amen? Everybody stand with the head bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to turn it over to the pastor. Hey, who are you this morning? Who are you this morning?